سادة والسيدات التالي عرض بعنوان الاستدامة في سلاسل الإمداد في ظل الظروف الراهنة يقدم العرض مساعد الرئيس للبرامج الدولية بجامعة ولاية ميشيغان الأمريكية الدكتور كيث نبلت Good afternoon everybody My name is Keith Besant Niblet and I'm very honored to be speaking to you today at this great supply chain conference. Uh, I'm very honored also to be a long-term partner with the Middle East Logistics Institute, uh, which has been our enduring partner for the last 12 years in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And of course, that's a part of the Al Makdoui group. And so uh, I'm here today to talk to you on behalf of Michigan State University. And just to give you a little insight into Michigan State University, then we are one of the top 100 research universities in the world. And we are number one in the world for supply chain. And so what I plan to do today is to give you some elements of what we are seeing in sustainability of business. I'm being fitted with something that looks like something from a spacecraft. And so there we are. Is that okay? Put that in my pocket. Which means I can move around now, which is a lot nicer. So Michigan State University currently is in Michigan. It's in East Lansing. It's the headquarters uh, of the world. We are also in 90 other countries, and our foundation is very firmly to try and help develop processes, methods, and systems throughout the world. Uh, we have an annual research budget in approaching $800 million a year, and the actual total revenue for uh, the organization is $1.3 billion. Um, and we have, on any given day on campus, 51,000 students, uh, of which 12,000 are masters, and we have 1,000 PhD students across our 15 colleges. So that gives you a feeling for what we are and uh, where I come from. Of course, what we're talking about is sustainability. And if we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about two separate things. We're talking about sustainability of the planet, and we're also talking about sustainability of businesses. And it is an absolute fact that businesses have to reinvent themselves now every 15 years. Now, that has come down in the last 15 years from 32 years. And if you were to take 25 years ago, then they said on averagely, then businesses could only reinvent themselves every 62 years. So now we're into this 15-year cycle. It's so important to understand why, and this slide will actually tell you if you can see it. It took airlines 64 years to actually arrive at 50 million users. It took television 22 years. It took Facebook four years, and it took Pokemon Go 19 days. That's the speed of change. And of course, the great driver for change, as previous speakers have said, is data and is technology. So I think it's important to understand that against the backdrop of how do you sustain your businesses on one hand, and how do we sustain the planet on the other hand. Oh, it's gone off. How do I get it back? There we are. It's, it's been a bit temperamental. I don't know what to do. Ah. If you were to look at the th two current models that we use in the United States, that is also relevant uh, to Europe as well, then you can see that the model on the left-hand side is about looking after three things. It's the planet, it's still retaining profit, 
because profit is essential, and it's also about developing the people because the change is going so fast. So that's one model that we're using because if you can actually get a combination of the three together, then you have sustainability right in the center of that Venn diagram. On the other side, you can also see how we are developing supply chain models to look after sustainability. And sustainability, therefore, has a financial element, it has an environmental element, and it also has a social element. And social is about shared knowledge, it's about accepting responsibility, it's about quality of life. It's interesting that this has now become a part of the United Nations, and the United Nations commissioned Kate Raworth, the economist, to develop a model which is seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. And you can actually see that as it's a result of this, certain cities throughout Europe and America are taking this model on board and they're trying to develop a sustainable environment. And visit Amsterdam and they've actually just about now completed the inner wheel. Now, what they're saying is that there is going to be ecological seedings around each living area, each living space, each city, each region, each hub. And within that, we have to manage all of those elements to make it work. So this is an example of a cradle-to-cradle -cradle supply chain. And I think it's really important to understand that much as well. It's done it to me again. What we're also coming down to is we're actually getting into flatter organizations. And if supply chain really is the entity of organizations, because you dig it up at one end and you produce something that you sell at the other end, then what we are understanding now of most businesses is that we're losing the many layers. And fundamentally, the way we articulate business at Michigan State now is in the corporate strategy, the business strategy, and the functional strategy. Now, the key there is that we are now looking at bottom-up strategy where strategy is so fast, it has to develop, you've only got 15 years to reinvent your business totally, that you have to rely on a lot of functional strategies for the day-to-day -day working. And this is important. Big ideas come from the top. Big strategy comes from the top. But the little incremental continuous improvement changes all happen at the bottom. I was mentioning to colleagues this morning, if you were to think about Edison inventing the electric light, then he didn't actually invent it. He had this big idea, this blue ocean vision of saying everything in New York should be electric. But he actually had 50 scientists that did continuous incremental improvements on just the light bulb for two years until they actually came up with a filament that would last for 100 hours. He had the big blue ocean idea, but the people at the bottom, the functional strategists, actually did most of the work. And so as a result of that, you still have the big ideas in strategy, and you still have the divisional strategists in the business strategy world that are focusing on core products, but at the bottom, you're enabling and allowing people at the bottom to make these incremental improvements that will develop strategy all by itself. And I think it's so important to be that because therefore the whole organization becomes a supply chain. It's absolutely inevitable that that happens. So we are living in a VUCA world. And this term is almost overused, but it's worth remembering that there is no way now, even with big data, that we can actually predict the future accurately. Most things happen almost as a surprise because it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. 
And therefore, the best you can do if you're running any company with supply chain in it is to actually constantly review, often using data systems to do so, in your specific market, what's happening politically, what's happening economically, what's happening socially, what's happening, the biggest driver of all technically, and also to understand the legal frameworks that surround them and the environmental frameworks. So when I build business plans for organizations, I always start with what is known as a PESTEL framework to try and understand the business and where the business may go knowing that it's a VUCA world. And I think it's really important that you constantly keep aligned with that. Why does it keep doing that? Strategy and supply chain is becoming a series of plans carried out at the highest possible speed. We haven't got time at corporate level now to sit and ruminate upon it and to think about endless board meetings before anything happens. Now, I love some of these quotes. I won't use anyone, but the top quote is my favorite quote. People in corporate can actually have a strategy but then the strategy never actually appears because the incremental changes that happens towards that strategy actually takes you somewhere else. And there was a very famous world heavyweight champion called Mike Tyson that said, I used to spend months training to actually have a strategy in the ring and then everything changed because somebody punched me in the mouth. And I think that's so important that you understand that if you're at corporate level. Lawrence Friedman, who is one of my heroes, one of the greatest strategy men of all times, actually said the world is full of strategy and full of disappointment and frustration of means not working and the ends not reached. Therefore, corporate teams will have to do strategy quickly, but never expect that strategy to actually result in the end game you envisaged when you created that strategy. And I think it's so important to think of that as a result of that, because of bottom-up strategy, then open system strategy is becoming the norm, where open system strategy, which is still evolving, is based on looking at markets in terms of political, economic, social, and technical, and then from there to actually take your decisions. And what, of course, business is all about is what it says in a part of those quotes here, is that von Clausewitz in 1832 actually said that the way you beat an enemy in a battle is to just look for their areas of weakness. And so you don't try and fight some people in a competitive marketplace just on their strengths. You look for a value proposition that is vastly different or as different as you can make it in a crowded market, in a VUCA world, as quickly as you possibly can. And the people that can do that fastest, bottom up, are the functional leaders that are doing continuous improvements because they're the ones that understand the market best because they're talking to customers every day. It does it every time. So what is the sustainable supply chain? I love this quote from the long and missed Steve Jobs. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect to your future. This is back to VUCA. This is back to doing your pastels. Supply chain strategy is an integrated part of the whole strategy of the organization. And as the supply chain or the value chain is integrating, then many organizations reside in just a part of it. So you have trucking companies and you actually have warehousing companies, but they're all a part of this end-to-end -end value chain or supply chain. And therefore, they've got to start talking to each other to try and get that integration. And therefore, separation, only when you're competing as a trucking company with another trucking company, but if you're actually dealing with a warehousing company, you try and get this developmental science together where you are all trying to add value in one go. And that will all be driven by VUCA because that means that every month, every six weeks, 
Every eight weeks, something is going to happen, which means that you have to change. Top of mind drivers that deserve deep consideration. When you do your pestle, then it's becoming incredibly important that we start to look at the ethical world. We've got an ethics institute at Michigan State University, and their golden rule is do the right thing in the right way for the right reason. And therefore, most business now cannot be conducted, conducted unethically. And there's also a tectonic shift, which is commonly called in Europe and America a ESG, which is about environmental and social and governance, which is back to the opening models that I showed you three or four slides ago. It's really important because if you look at Deloitte's in 2022, they're creating investment opportunities purely and simply for ethical considerations. And it's a major part in the strategy focus driven by politics, legal and social externally and stakeholders internally because stakeholders as well want ethics. And so if you're considering your strategy for the next three months, six months, year, then one of the things that you've got to think about is ethics. Therefore, what's happening is that shareholder capitalism, which we see every day, where everybody's trying to maximize shareholder value, therefore the stock exchanges in Europe and in America, is about one driver, which is all about profit. And in point of fact, Friedman in 1962 said, capitalism is a necessary condition for political freedom. Correct. But it isn't at the loss of the people, and it isn't at the loss of the planet. And so we are now into an era of stakeholder capitalism. And stakeholder capitalism was the complete theme of 2020 in Davos. And it was supported by the World Economic Forum and all the national and global banks. And if you want to look at the description of that, then probably Stiglitz said it best. Shareholder wealth maximization doesn't maximize societal welfare. This is being called progressive capitalism, and it includes delivering value to customers, investing in employees, dealing ethically with suppliers, transparency of long-term value to shareholders, and also Sisodia, who was the founder of Whole Foods, added to that list to the word conscious capitalism, that we don't sell anything that we consciously wouldn't consume ourselves. And so, as you see this whole global shift in the VUCA world, then you can see that we're moving to an era where actually shareholder capitalism is not particularly well recognized over stakeholder capitalism. And that comes back to the original model of people and planet and finance. And you can actually see now in a lot of organizations where they are saying, we have a certain amount of money that we will fund charity. We have a certain amount of money when we will do good works for the people that surrounds us. If you look at Salesforce in the West Coast of America, then they are building schools for the, the children of their employees. They're building social housing. So you can see that it goes beyond a company making a profit anymore, and it goes into a social system that they're involved in. It means that they are ethical in the eyes. And it's really interesting because, again, Saudi Arabia is one of these countries with a young population. You know, your population average is 27 and a half years. The population average in, in Germany is 43 years. So you are a young population. And if you look at younger millennials and Gen Z, then they would actually put the planet and social needs before even a job. And I believe that is significant also in Saudi. If you were to look at change, then John Cotter is the man that talks about this, and he's developed this eight-step model. Now, when he wrote it 20 years ago, he thought this was top-down. This now is being implemented at the moment by General Motors in my home state of Michigan, 
from bottom up. In other words, everybody is learning how to make electric vehicles using John Cotter, and because it's incremental change on the production lines, then they are using this model from the bottom up, therefore creating strategy from the top down. And if you go around this model, and I won't do it now, but you can see that it can work for the guy on the production line, it can work for the IT worker that is guiding the, all the supplies that goes onto the production line, as well as it can actually work for the guys in the boardroom. And so if this becomes a unifying model of constant and continuous change, and everybody understands it throughout the organization, they're playing from the same hymn sheet. And I think it's important to understand that. If you were to look at what I often teach in the past, then it was Porter's Five Forces model. And that was the way in which you tried to understand the competition. That's been replaced. Because instead of actually doing that, which is quite an onerous process, and the process of many case studies, then in business now, they're using the industry analysis model. So when you are actually understanding the industry you're in, here is the model. And it's really very quick to do. And again, what we are implementing across the states through Michigan State University is enabling functional employees to be able to do this for their line specifically. So a guy that is building a specific model of car can use this to say, I think we should change this a bit because I've now done my industry analysis model and I actually know from my mark that we could add this and take away this. It all becomes, if you like, a big electronic suggestion box, which means you can do continuous improvement almost on a monthly basis. And it's important to understand that. Another model that we're actually embarking at in three levels is for people to look at their own product life cycles. Now, if a business has to reinvent itself every 15 years, then it is likely that the business follows a big product life cycle. But within that, the business will have products which could only be one year, two years, or three years. But if you don't recognize that, then you don't understand at the end when suddenly all that sales revenue goes lost. And product life cycles are getting shorter and shorter and shorter because change is happening faster and faster. So another model that we're using throughout the businesses that we work with is looking at the product life cycles of each individual product or each individual service. And that actually fits neatly straight into supply chain. This is a very sensitive tool. Ugh. Another thing we're doing from the bottom up is we're making sure that all of the teams, say in a warehouse, say on the factory line, say in a transportation depot, learn the rules of agility. Now to do that, they've got to be facing outside in and not inside out. And so the most important thing they do is understand on a daily basis customers' needs. Therefore, they frequently gather customer feedback. They then don't fear change. They actually are the engines for small change, incremental change, and they make tangible progress continuously. And so some of our most popular training courses are to do with going in to the functional workforces and actually teaching them how to be agile. Now, that can only work as long as the next level approve of it, and the board ratifies it. But if we can get that understanding, agility has created tremendous gains, which are incremental change gains on a weekly and a monthly basis, and actually increase productivity by anything up to 10% within three months. Obviously, and the previous speakers talked about it, then every form of technology is happening in supply chain at the greatest speed. Augmented reality, which is why Facebook became meta. Facebook is finished, really. It's done its 11-year cycle, 15-year cycle has to completely change. 
The metaverse is where he's going to. He's reinventing the business. And of course, augmented reality is he sees as a part of the big future. Therefore, augmented reality as a training and learning tool, as a developmental tool, is, is gaining pace. Data analytics, and of course there's all forms of data analytics because you can do predictive data and you can do reactive data which normally comes from within your own business. It's the aggregation together of both of those that means that you can actually have that 90 day advantage in the market. If you were to look at classic case studies of that, then Zara actually has both reactive data from their shops and predictive data by actually web crawling on the web to discover whether a blue dress should be a red dress in three weeks time. Because you can data crawl not by looking at websites, but by looking at what is on the blogs, what is in the conversations. And that means that with data analytics, you're now getting into all forms of machine learning, but also artificial learning. And it could well be that very shortly, we'll be using quantum to try and analyze that data at the highest possible speed. Cloud computing joins it all together. Who owns the biggest market share in the world of cloud computing? Well, it's called Amazon. They've got 34%. If you were to think about that, then there's a huge amount of power just in one company. Then there's autonomous robots. Again, if you go to an Amazon warehouse, then 50% of all the routine jobs is now done by robots. And it will go up and up and up. And we all know that some cars now are made completely by robots. That is going to become a part of everyday life. In North America, there's such a shortage of basic servers in restaurants, they're starting to use robots to actually deliver the food. So you can see how robotic technology is actually going at a massive speed. The industrial internet of things, it, the IoT, is so important because I talked about it earlier. If you're in transport and you want to know about warehouses, don't pick them, the phone up, get a data stream that runs between the two of you so you can actually create a continuous service. And also the new thing is additive manufacturing. And of course that means that you can therefore make houses on the moon with 3D technology. So as soon as you actually start thinking about all of this, this is happening at the speed that Pokemon Go is actually launching on the market. And all of these things are so important when you're considering the future of your businesses. Customer experience is becoming huge. It's quite interesting because we are obviously the car capital of the world in Michigan. Therefore, we study Chrysler and we study Ford and we study General Motors very closely. When Ford sells an F-150, they don't leave it there. They follow their customers. They have chips in the cars that can tell how many times they break in a day. They've got chips in the cars that tells if, uh, if, the, if indeed that one of the tires is going down. But they also have face-to-face -face meetings with their customers and they'll find them in car parks in Home Depot or one of the big superstores and they'll say to them, now you've bought the car, how can we improve it? And so they have, through customer experience, developed a continuous line straight back to their moving supply chain. And if you were to believe this, I found it incredible. But as a result of customer uh, experience feedback from the last five years, they've now got 220,000 variations of the F-150 truck that they can offer customers if they ask for it because they've asked for them in the car parks after they bought the vehicle and they'll add them in. It might be just two extra lights, it might be a slightly different mirror or a window, it could be some tiny little things. But it means that every truck they produce on the moving production line now is tailor-made precisely to the needs and the future needs of the customer. So nothing now is standard on the F-150. Everything is something you can buy, and there's 220,000. I'm told if you buy a new F-150, it takes you six hours to buy it because there's so many checklists that you can go through. But this is all done, really, basically, by interviewing customers after they've actually bought the vehicle. And this is what customer experience strategy is becoming in most modern organizations. And 
supply chain is really simple because you've often only got 20 big customers. And if you can't do customer experience strategies for those 20 big customers, then you're actually not doing your job anymore. Design thinking is really interesting. It's a huge thing that's going on because it's not iterative. What you're trying to do, von Trompenar, is you're trying to find those low gaps in the competitive landscape. And you're saying, if I design in a certain way, will I fill that gap? If I empathize with my specific market and I define what the gap could be, how do I ideate? How does that happen? This is incredibly creative. And the best people that do it are the people that are at the bottom because they're so close to the customer. They see their customers every day. And some of the best ideas don't come from the board, they actually come from the bottom. And then, of course, you don't launch straight away, you prototype, and then you test. And so that's another idea that you should be thinking of right now. And then, of course, there's customer journey mapping. And that's really important because customers don't buy you immediately. It's really interesting that if you look at millennials and Gen Z, then they don't react to a mail shot. They don't relax to an ad on, te uh, on television. What they do is they make up their own minds by a series of influencers. Now, the influencer might be as simple as a blog post about a product that they actually find on their own personal web space. It might be five friends that they have that have actually tried out what that product or service is. It might be that they actually have a favorite influencer. So if you were to look at some of the families that influence and make millions out of it in the States, then there are some very famous families like the Kardashians that influence teenagers and young 20s in their fashions, in their lipstick, in their makeup. They don't actually advertise. There's a company in America which I find fascinating called Crumble. And they make cookies. And that's all they make. And they make the different fillings in the cookies. And it was two guys, age 21 and 22, that invented this. And when they started making it, the only actual place that they advertised it was on TikTok. And what they do is they set up 14-day competitions and say, we've got five flavors we can put in the cookie. You vote. And every day they update and say, strawberries winning and blackberries second and things like that. On the 14th day, they announce that it's going to go into their shops for the winning. And then they start it all over again. They don't advertise anywhere else. But the kids flock to crumble. And they've now got 200 franchises across America every time a new flavor comes out. They have never advertised on TV, they've never advertised on radio, they've never sent a mail shot out. Everything is TikTok. It's influencing. And I think it's so important to understand the modern customer journey, which is nothing like the traditional sales funnel that we used to know even five years ago. And customer journey mapping is the future. So there's another thing that you can do to combat change. Remember, disruptive innovation works these days. It's really important to actually understand that when Clay Christensen invented, in Michigan, by the way, um, uh, disruptive innovation, everybody thought he was crazy. And just very quickly, then he was actually given by Burger King the job to actually try and improve um, the sales of milkshakes. And milkshakes had just been a standard product for years. And he went into Burger King for a month and said, how can I disrupt this business? And he discovered that people actually buy milkshakes regularly for two reasons. In the morning, they buy them on the way to work for breakfast. And after school, they take their kids there to have a milkshake. So how do you therefore customize milkshakes for people that actually have breakfast every morning? And how do you customize milkshakes to make them incredibly attractive? By doing that, he exploded the sales of milkshake in Burger King by 45% and disrupted the whole market because people from McDonald's and the other chains were going there just for their milkshakes. So it's important that you do these little incremental changes, but you deeply understand how the market is in disruption, which means that you've got to understand the customer journey. 
And it's so important to combine that together. Now, he actually also coined the notion is that we don't buy anything anymore. We hire it. So every morning, when you buy your milkshake for breakfast, you're actually hiring it because you're hiring another one tomorrow and they're hiring another one the day after. And then if you can get the combination of muesli and things right in the milkshake, then you will get a captive customer that hires a milkshake from you every day. Very important to understand what disruptive innovation is. And it, of course, is all a part now of the VUCA world where unseen competition can suddenly storm into your weak point and take over considerable market share. Another method that's used a lot in supply chain is sprint. You don't do one thing at a time, you do three things at a time. It's dynamic. It's all about timing. It's all about using machine learning. It's all about now using AI and using predictive analytics and taking risks. And therefore, if you want to go for quick wins, then sprint is the answer. And road mapping that sprint is the answer. Now, in the old days, we used to call it project management. But you don't do the detail of project management anymore. You road map. And they enable the people with flexible workforces to do that for you. So there's another technique that you can actually apply almost immediately. Sprint is a very easy thing to do. There's a lot of experts around the world. And of course, what you were talking about last time is how you have the skills that you need to develop in the workforce to face this VUCA world. This is called Industry 4.0. This has been well researched actually in our university and many others. But what we are saying the new workforce needs today is the technical skills to do the job. They all must be trained and developed in complex problem solving skills. They've got to have cognitive skills because it's really funny because of the cell phone age, we don't actually notice what's around us. And so we actually develop them in cognitive skills. They've got to have social skills because discussion, consensus and synergy is so much more important than making individual decisions. They've got to have communication skills, the ability to be able to pass on the ideas that they have and listen to other people's ideas. And they've also got to have personal skills. All of this can be trained. It's not a part of their fundamental personality that you can't train. It's developable and it's easy to do. And it's wonderful because it's in human group learning potential. And so again, one of our big things that we're doing with whole workforces is to actually look at Industry 4.0 skills and try to develop those. And it's so important that you actually think about this individually and collectively. That then turns into what is the house of quality. And you can see that uh, you've got all of the things that are joined together, the foundational skills at the bottom, then you've got the industrial technology pillars, and then you've got the operator roles at the top, which are about augmented smart, analytics, collaborative, and social. If you join all that together, you've suddenly got an integrated organization that can work for the next two years. And then, finally, because we're near the end, and I think I've done my time. Then think about two minutes, is it? Right, thank you. Then if you look at McKinsey, who are really implementing this from a consultancy basis, then they're saying, you are now reinventing your organization. Remember the 15-year product life cycle. You've got to look at your purpose. You've got to look at your value agenda. You've got to look at your culture. And then you then take the ecosystem around the edge. This then covers off sustainability in your business and sustainability of the planet. And all of those are gathered together. So my final point is the way you do it in the future is by proactive, collaborative, shared leadership for sustainability, predict change, foster teamwork, Become an expert in the global world. Know that trading patterns shift annually and therefore you can't rely on them. And use the power of artificial intelligence. Your strength will always be asking the right questions. Thank you.